Hello, welcome to Caldwell County Today. Today we have joining us representatives from the Department of Social Service in recognition of Social Work Month. Welcome ladies, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm gonna start by letting them introduce themselves and tell us what their title is and then we'll get into a, a bigger conversation about what you do and what social work. Okay, we'll start over here with Miss Luanda. Yes, my name is Luanda Knox and I am an adoption social worker um, in Child Protective Services. Okay. My name is Katherine Wright. I do CPS investigations. I am a supervisor for that department. Okay. I'm Beverly Rebird and I'm Adult Protective Services supervisor. Right. And I'm April Wiles Williamson and I'm an Adult Protective Service social worker. Okay, ladies, I'm gonna start with like what I think may be very basic and what people may already know, but in broad terms, and this is for whoever wants to answer it, what is social work? How do you define social work if you're talking to either a small child or maybe somebody that just don't know? How do you define it? Well, in child welfare, kind of when we talk to children and explain our job is just we are there um, to make sure children are safe and that they have everything that they need at home um, and just kind of an extra set of eyes to help a child if they have any con care or concerns with at home or have something that maybe they don't feel like is appropriate um, to share that with us because that's our job is to make sure our child is safe at home what about the adult side pretty much kind of the same as child protective services we want disabled adults 18 and older um, and the elderly to be able to remain safe in their home and to provide services they need as they are aging. So I didn't ask, but there's a lot of experience here around the table. How have you seen social work change over the years? There's a lot more paperwork. <laughs> Um, and when I first started, when um, we needed to recruit adoptive families for the children whose um, permanent plan was adoption, foster parents were not allowed to adopt the children that they had cared for in their homes that so we would have to recruit um, outside of Caldwell County. Um, that has changed because we, or the state, realizes that connections made should be connections kept. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we have quite a few of our uh, children adopted by the foster parents who have cared for them. Okay. Um, right around the table we have child service, adoption services, adult protective services. As you work, what other social workers do you work with? Not just maybe in your agency, but beyond that. We work with a lot of social workers and um, community agencies. Mm -hmm. um, we work a lot with hospice and the senior center because um, a lot of times when we have cases we're trying to put services in the home to keep that person in the home and keep them safe. We do a lot of services to help caregivers get respite. So we work a lot you know with um, Western Piedmont Council of Governments um, and then we also have several other programs in adult services that I don't supervise. We have guardianship and um, we do placement assistance and we also um, have the SAN home program. Okay. What about on the child side of things? So we work a lot with school social workers. Um, we work really closely with our school social workers that are in this county or if we have kids in other counties. Um, and hospital social workers, um, those are the two that I can think of most frequently that we do work with. I'm not sure if I'm missing any. And we work with when we have children placed um, in group homes mm -hmm. outside of the um, county or inside the county, we work with social workers in that setting, um, especially when you have private agencies who also um, have direct contact with our clients, we work with them as well. Okay. <clears throat> So there's a lot of different types of social work out there. And I'm gonna ask each of you, and I'm gonna start over here with April because she has been really quiet since we've started this conversation. <laughs> so April, why did you become a social worker? Hmm. I think I became a social worker because um, my family has always been in public service and I grew up around it. And I just wanted to take uh, one step further in 
to um, public sa um, public health to help people. Okay. Beverly, I'm... Well, my mother's a retired social worker, so I guess you could say it's kind of in our blood. <laughs> um, to help people. That's the main reason. Um, when I was in school, mental health um, was something I really sparked me. And um, I think that's the, the other reason is to help adults that can't help themselves. Mm -hmm. All right, so I got, I guess, into social work is, it's a little different. I went to law school and graduated. I have a law degree. And so while I was in law school, the summer after I graduated studying for the bar, I actually was a targeted case manager. And so I have two daughters that I adopted from the foster care system. So instead of becoming an attorney for Child Protective Services, because I felt that you're making decisions for kids that you don't know, you're in, you know you've never seen their face, you've never been in their homes or met their parents, um, I didn't like that. I like to be on the front end and actually see the parents or and meet the children that I'm making these decisions for um, and try to put in services to keep families together instead of on the back end of um, when you get to that point of where you're already in court. Um, my, I'm a little more like Catherine. Uh, my degree is in journalism. and um, But when I had my daughter, who was a preemie, I stopped work and um, met this lady when I was working part-time who was an adoption social worker um, in Catawba County. And she kept talking to me about, she thought I had the personality um, to be a, a social worker. And so once I started looking for full-time work, I did apply and I was a parent educator and, and then a social worker and then I worked with teen moms and I fell in love with it. Um, the people that you meet, um, changes our lives as much as we change their lives and so it is a calling I think mm -hmm. for us who have been in here for some time for those of us who have. Talk to me a little bit about the populations you serve and I realize that Beverly and April yours are kind of be pretty similar because you work together but just a little bit about who are you serving? Um, our population is 18 years and up but they have to be disabled. So we work with a lot of disabled adults and the elderly. Okay, what about, now Now yours is gonna be a little bit different, okay? What about mm -hmm. on the child side? So for Child Protective Services, we work from birth until 18. Um, now there is a program that we have, that LaWanda could probably explain a little bit better, of 18 to 20, 21 um, for those children that age out of foster care. But for our services, we work um, for children from birth to 18. And with adoptions um, or foster care, because I do foster care <coughs> as well, um, we work with the children who are placed in our care who could be from birth. Um, as Catherine has stated, um, at 18, children who are um, in foster care are given the option to sign a voluntary placement agreement, a VPA and is to help them to stay in school and support them um, until they're 21 because sometimes they're just not ready at 18 to be out on their own. Um, and at any time, if they decide to leave even at 18, they can come back up until they're 21. Mm -hmm. um, I have worked with um, a coworker and she's had several of her 18 to 21 year olds in college. And so we still have to make the visits there, not as often, but I've been to East Tennessee State University, which is a beautiful campus, um, just to <laughs> see, you know, those clients. So um, that's zero to, to 21 mm -hmm. on our end, if, because they don't have disabilities and they would not be, um, um, transfer to adult services, though we do have some at 18 who yes, we that transfer. was what I was going to kind of say. You'd ask what's changed mm -hmm. yeah, in adult protective so services. From when I started 14 years ago, our population was mainly older Americans. But now we are seeing so many 18-year-olds, and we're getting a lot of them from the foster care system that either have um, severe mental illness or IDD, and they, um, they just are able to make it on their own. They don't have the resources yet. And a lot of times we end up um, having to do guardianship over them 
but we are seeing an increase between 18 and 30 year olds and I don't know if it's with the substance abuse on the rise I, I don't know but we are seeing a lot dealing with a lot younger population and that's new for us <laughs> and a lot of our workers we've had because most of us are used to working with 60 and up and so. I'll be honest when I think of your population I think of older Americans mm -hmm. I don't think about the 18 to 30 35 40 yes I think we actually have five wards now that are between 18 and 23 about how many wards do you have 51 at this time okay and I'm gonna ask you the same question about roughly how many cases how many clients are you dealing with at a time okay so for investigations um, assessments so the last year has been a little different with COVID um, mm -hmm. because with kids not being in school and not kind of being in the community our numbers have decreased significantly that doesn't mean you know abuse neglect dependency have de has decreased it's just the number of reports that we receive um, so but normally an average is probably right now a worker will get it between seven to ten a month and we have 15 assessor investigators and so right now that's an average and mm -hmm. it kind of works on it's a you know some months are lower some months are higher sure. now for foster care I'm not sure we have over 150 under 100. children mm -hmm. who are in foster care at this time and yes. that's children here in Caldwell County yes. children who um, base home was in Caldwell okay. County. They may not be placed in Caldwell County, um, mm -hmm. depending on their needs and, and what would be the best fit for them. But mm -hmm. as, but if they fall under your purview? Yes. 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 Okay. So. And then we have over 550 adoptive children that um, we do post adoption services where their contact for the parents if they need uh, have to have questions answered so we may have a question from someone in Maryland because we've done adoptions there all over the country and so we're on standby or their connection to ask those types of questions as well how long are you on standby for those families until they're 18 or now because if a child is adopted at 16 they can um, they can re there are programs for them until they're 21 and so I just did one uh, paperwork for um, a young man who was adopted at 16 with three of his brothers. And so he will receive our services until he's 21. So that's how. And as wow. they age out, you know, mm -hmm. they come off of the post-adoptions um, database. Let's talk about the differences because adult services faces some different guidelines, different rules than what Child Protective Services. First, tell me kind of what is, without getting way down in the weeds, what is the overarching, some of the rules, guidelines you have for children, for protecting children? As in like what do we do? What do you do? So when we first initially get a call in um, on our intake line, if it is screened in, there's certain guidelines that it has to meet in order to even be screened in for an assessment or an investigation. And I think the, as a community, they need to like we'll get calls, and sometimes they'll just there'll be one line that makes it a screen in or a screen out. Um, and so from there, we have guidelines that probably dictate every part of everything that we do from there. <laughs> um, and so I guess we will investigate a case. We have 45 days to make that case decision. It can be less, it can be more. If it is more, we have to make a case decision to send it to what's called case management slash in-home services. Or if there's enough to write a petition where a child is unsafe, then we'll go to um, foster care permanency. Um, I'm not sure if that answers That answers the question, question, but I have but, a follow-up question. Okay. What makes a child, a an environment unsafe for a child? I mean, I know there are a million things, but... Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it can be a multitude of anything, but I guess a, making a child unsafe, I think I guess it's a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. It depends on if it's substance use, if there's domestic violence. It just basically means the adults or the caregivers in that home are not keeping this child safe from harm 
at that time or there's not an appropriate caregiver. Again, it could be due to substance use, domestic violence. Um, this, the home itself could be in disarray to where a child cannot stay there. That Again, that determines is the child two and crawling around or is the child 16. There's different standards. So I guess that's a difficult question to answer because it's always a case-by-case -case basis because what we walk into a home if it's a three-year-old may be different if we walk into the home and it's like a 16-year-old. Okay, you've yes. answered my question. <laughs> because now I want to turn over to the adult side. What are some of your guidelines and, and requirements? It's different with adults because adults have a choice. If adult has capacity, which is the ability to understand the consequences of their actions or the consequences of their choices, then they have that right. And a lot of adults make bad choices, but if they have capacity, they have that right. Um, if they don't have capacity and they don't understand, then that's a whole different issue. Um, and I think the biggest myth with adult services is that DSS is going to come in and place you. We cannot place someone unless they do not have capacity. An adult can live and feel they can do, they, they can, have that choice. They can live the way they want to live and it's okay as long as they have the capacity to understand mm -hmm. that what they're going through has consequences and they're okay with that and they can try to overcome it. Mm -hmm. So a house doesn't necessarily have to have running water or um, it can be a hoarding situation mm -hmm. as long as there's capacity. Mm -hmm. Now, just because they have capacity doesn't mean we're not going to do anything. We always offer um, someone services. We always try, try to help. In a lot of cases, they will. In some cases, they won't. And like I said, they have that choice. Um, I think that's the hardest part of our job is seeing people make bad choices and there not be anything we can do about it. How do you determine capacity? It's their ability to understand. They have to um, understand that, that the, each choice they make has a consequence. They have to understand every decision and can they follow through? Like you can ask someone, what would you do in an emergency? Well, I'll call 911. Well, how do you call 911? It's going beyond just the answer. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything you want to add to that, April? Um, they also, for what we received the report on, they have to have that capacity of if their house is cluttered and they keep falling during the clutter uh, with the clutter um, they got to they have to understand the clutter is causing them to fall and if they don't understand that that's when we um, have to go an extra step and either offer them services or if they don't have capacity then we go another step to ask if there's a power of attorney to help them or take the next step to, to guardianship mm -hmm. and we only capacity is in the area of protection like they may not be able to understand one thing but the issue is if like we had a, um, a little man with dementia mm -hmm. And either he just, it was really bad dementia, but he was maintaining the only area he was having problems with was his medication. But he understood. He would tell us, I forget to take my medication. I need help with my medication. Well, he has capacity in that area. So that's what we would work with him on. We, we can't just, take someone out of their home for no reason. And to determine capacity, you really sit down and talk to these people. I don't want oh, to say interview them. I'm, we do multiple home visits. We um, medical records. We talk to collateral contacts. It's an in-depth process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's ultimately based on our opinion. Um, but we it's more than that it's like i said medical records talking to doctors talking to um family members talking to neighbors 
it's a lengthy process. And we have our um, limits. It depends. Um, we have 30 days to investigate um, and neglect or abuse case. But if it's exploitation of um, money or medication, it's 45 days. So we have a little longer with those cases. So you really see the scope. I mean, it, there is elder abuse. I mean, that. Oh, yes. And oh, it's yes. increasing, especially exploitation of assets is increasing. We're seeing a large rise in that. Do you think, let me just ask this, how has COVID impacted what you see going on in homes? And I'll, I'll just ask that across the board. I mean, well, how, I think um, our case numbers are different. Mm -hmm. They're on the rise now again. But I think, you know, people weren't going into homes. People weren't leaving their homes. So the normal people that would go in and see what's going on and make a report haven't been able to do that. So I think there's probably the numbers haven't changed. It's just that there's not been people in there to lay eyes on them to know what's going on. And I'm going to ask the same thing over here. How, how has it impacted your clients, your caseloads? So I'll say yes. So the kind of like what Beverly said is the individuals that would see our children, that would go into the homes, really weren't there. So the reporting decreased, but not necessarily the neglect or, or, or abuse did. Um, so that has, I guess, that has been very significant in the end. Another thing is kind of, it's not now, but a couple months after COVID kind of started is everyone was in their homes. They're kind of, that's when we were seeing a lot of reports that were just really bad because everyone's been cooped up in their home. They're not getting services um, because a lot of services around here, they weren't going in, you know, they weren't doing their normal practices. So you really couldn't get into your mental health, your substance use, your mm -hmm. things like that. So or your domestic violence assessments. So there really weren't any services that parents could have. And so the reports that we were getting were really bad. Um, and I know as far as for foster care, and LaWanda could probably talk more on this, is what we're seeing is for placement purposes, there's no placements really available in all of North Carolina, especially for those if you have to get a higher level of care, like you need a therapeutic home or you need a PRTF, which is a psychiatric residential treatment facility, there would be no openings because a lot of children weren't moving or you would, they would, there would be a COVID outbreak, so they weren't having inpatients. So the, I, mean, I remember cases where we were looking at Tennessee, we were looking at New Mexico, Texas, because there was nowhere in North Carolina that was open, and that's across the state is... Um, we would have children in our offices for weeks at a time because we could not find placement. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything. And then with the court system, yes. because mm -hmm. the courts were um, closed, closed because of COVID. And so that meant that some of the cases and children's permanent plans mm -hmm. couldn't move forward or if we had to do um, a termination of parental rights. Those, those cases got put on hold, so those permanent plans for children, mm -hmm. even to be returned home could not happen because that we didn't have court for so long. So that was, you know, mm -hmm. one of the um, um, effects of COVID on our um, children. And I'm sure court was the same for you guys. Yes, and placement. We had a lot of um, mm -hmm. older um, people who needed to go into placement and Good. they weren't accepting or mm -hmm. they would have to have a COVID vaccine. and. It would take, I think it took us like three weeks to get one guy placed. So then the social workers having to go out a lot more because they're not safe in the home. That's why we're placing them. But there was a delay in the process. Mm -hmm. We've also um, seen a rise of mental health because um, the fam, I mean, the adult was, uh, he, they couldn't get out and they would um, they get depressed because there's no socialization. Um, so the mental health has rised. Um, also, um, the adults can't, um, they, ha they can't uh, go into the doctor's offices mm -hmm. because they were video conferencing and our elderly, is, some just don't know how to work the right. smartphone <laughs> systems and, and things of that nature. So they, it, 
they were hard to get to the doctor's offices and things of that nature. So really a big impact. Mm -hmm. I'm going to throw another question mm -hmm. out there. If there's one thing you wish someone understood about your job, what is that? Um, I don't know where to start. April, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Sorry, I'll throw you <laughs> under the bus. <laughs> That's okay. Um, one thing that I wish that people would understand is we go in we go into people's home because we care we go in there um, wanting to help them and wanting them to have the services that they need in their home and um, be able to thrive in our community um, we're not the people that go in and say oh you got to come out or however we want you to be safe in no matter where you are whether it, you have to go into a nursing home or if you can just get the services that you need in the home that's what uh, we care is what we would like to know beverly can you add to that she did a beautiful job there. <laughs> yeah she did <laughs> um just mainly that we aren't the bad guy you know you go to a, ho a lot of homes and you say you're a dss it doesn't always come off good. We're not, we are there because we care. We're there to try to help your situation. We're there to try to help your family member, your loved one be safe, get the services they need, you know, be able to use community resources. But a lot of times we get hit with a lot of non-participation, you know, mm -hmm. no, I'm not working with you because you're DSS, you know, that's, mm -hmm. I think anybody who's a social worker goes into it thinking they're going to save the world. We learn really fast that we're not going to save the world, but you know, at the end of the day, if we've helped one person, that's what matters. <laughs> so I guess, yes, I would just piggyback kind of off of what both of them said is that, especially with Child Protective Services, is if I have to go into a home, I always start with, I know no one likes us to be there. Like no one when they call and they're like, oh yeah, DSS is coming, like, come on over, um, <laughs> is that we really do try to work with parents and we are there to make sure children are safe, but we understand that children don't come with a, you know, they don't come with a playbook. No one really knows how to be a parent. There's difficulties that we all face and that we really want to just help, help individuals out and we will do and try to you know put services and work with families where if we ever do have to remove a child it's our last effort of what we there was nothing else that could work there was no other family members or no services or we were getting that pushback from families where that is not our end goal our goal is always to keep children in their home because obviously that is where children belong is in their their natural home um and so i guess that is what i would tell everyone is that I always say, you know, everyone looks at us as a curse where we're, we're in there, but sometimes families don't know all the services that they are, that are available to them. And sometimes it's just there, we can help them get linked to services that they don't know are out there that could be beneficial to their family. So sometimes it can be a blessing where we can be there to, to help something that they may, you know, didn't know existed in Caldwell County. Melinda? And I would mm -hmm. say that um, piggyback Mm -hmm. on all of them we're here as a as a support system use us mm -hmm. um, also know that DSS is on call 24 7 we don't get Christmas breaks and mm -hmm. at 5 o'clock everybody thinks we go home no um, if a child is in the hospital two weeks ago there was a child who had to be hospitalized we had to line up I went in at 4 o'clock in the morning to sit with that child until some other Another social worker relieved me. Um, mm -hmm. Supervisors do the same thing. So we are, I've had calls on Christmas. You know, this is what's going on with your client. And so we are. Um, I know a lot of people don't see us as essential workers, but we see what we do as essential in taking care of, of families, not just children, but families. And so that's what I wish people would to know that we do care. Oh, I, I have seen it <laughs> firsthand. I've had jobs where I've worked with DSS, with their staff, and, and you really do. It's a caring group of people who work together. And the other thing I want to comment on is your work with the community. You're not doing your job 
alone in a box. You're reaching out and finding connections for people. And I think that's so important. So thank you for that. If someone, and again, I'm, I'm going to have to ask the adult side and the children's <laughs> side because there's so many services offered by DSS. I would encourage you that if you have a need and you think DSS can help you, just to give them a call. Uh, I'm going to start with the children's side. If someone needs to get in touch with you, and I guess, Catherine and Lawanda, it's going to be a little bit different for each of you because your services while you both serve children um, two different areas there so Catherine we'll start with you um, how do people get in touch with you if they need to um, file a complaint I, is that the right terminology so, yeah so if they need to make a report or just kind of get general information or even if because some parents just reach out because they do need preventative services or they don't know what to do it's not necessarily a report but they just they need mental health counseling for their child or something, you would call 426-8200 and ask for Child Protective Services. Um, I think the direct line is 426-8257, I believe. We can put the number on the screen. Okay. Um, and so they would just call there. That's our intake where they would make any kind of report or, again, um, there is some, sometimes we do work with families for preventative services where it's not necessarily a report is not open up. But if they just need that link to a mental health provider or substance use or um, where maybe a link to their heat's not on and we can give them that information, um, that would be who, where to start with us. And for us, um, my team also does licensing foster um, for foster parents. Um, and we, um, people tend not to know that we also do adoptions for the community. We do relative adoptions if a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or a step parent um, is planning to adopt. Then they, um, of course, contact an attorney, but sometimes they have questions for us that we, we can answer. So they call us about that or if they've adopted a child, um, we can connect them with a post-adoption services um, agency out of Catawba County. So they would call um, the 426-8200 and ask for the adoptions unit and that will, um, we will pass it around until we find out exactly how to answer that question and who should be answering that question. Before I let you go, and I have one more question, foster parents. Mm -hmm. What is the need for foster parents in Caldwell County? It is a huge need, mm -hmm. especially for sibling groups um, of three or more and also of older children. Most of our teens are placed out of county because we don't have foster homes who um, have a availability um, mm -hmm. and for that, them. Yes, and that will become a greater need in the future because for older children because they're getting, North Carolina is going away with what's called congregate care, which are like what we consider group homes. Um, and so there's like a, a licensing that's kind of different now. And so those older children will need foster homes because um, they want to make it more family-like settings. Um, so those children will need foster homes. How does a person or a couple become foster parents? Um, they make a, con they contact us, of course. Um, and we have two um, licensing social workers, and what they typically do is ask some questions, send them an application, go through the application. Um, once it's returned, there um, there's a class uh, that they have to take. They have to have their house inspected by the fire marshal. Um, they have to make sure that they have um, uh, their criminal records are checked fingerprinting's done, they have to take first aid, they have to have a physical. It's more to it because as I tell um, some of our foster children who may say, well, this is strict, you know, for foster parents, we're held at a higher level um, for placing those children in that care. So when they ask us, oh, why, why do we have these rules? We have to. Um, and so that's what foster parents, it takes about three to five months, depending on when they come um, into the class. Right now we're doing a lot of virtual classes, and I'm not sure, I know they're having one currently, and I'm not sure when they're looking to do another, but they can certainly um, contact Valerie Ackerman 
and I don't know her name. That's mm -hmm. okay. We can again, we can put it on the screen. But I figured while we had a chance, we <laughs> would definitely talk about foster care. Thank you. Okay, ladies, Adult Protective Services. How does someone reach y'all? We have a direct line four two six eight two eight eight. Um, that's actually Jean Stafford. She does all of our intake, and she can answer any questions regarding adult services. Um, if you need to make a report, if you need to do, um, you have a family member that you're POA over and they need placement in a facility, she can take those. Um, and we also have a services social worker who we do what we call outreach cases. It's not a report, but if we don't help get some services out there, it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So we, um, we do have a social worker who does outreach and um, can provide immediate services. So if they have any questions about what services are in the community, resources, you know, they think somebody's being neglected or abused, just call the 426-8288 and Jean can help with that process. Okay. Thank you. Before we wrap up today, I want to ask if anybody has any final thoughts, anything that's popped into your head that you're like, oh, we definitely need to mention this. Um, I'm just going to open it up and make sure that you have covered what you feel like you wanted to cover today. No, I think, I think we've so. covered it. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad we've covered everything. I always <laughs> want to make sure we ask. And uh, again, I think the thing to remember is if you think DSS might be able to help you, call their main number because there probably is a service there that they can connect you with. So that's probably the lesson to take out t today. And if you are interested in becoming a foster parent, reach out to Valerie Ackerman uh, because that meet is great here in our community. Thank you for joining us, for being here, for taking time out of your schedule because I know you have clients to see and cases to work on. So thank you, I really do appreciate it. And thank you for what you're doing for our community. And thank you for watching Caldwell County today.